Hi, this is Eric with mobilemusthave.com and liveinlight.net. And today we're going to talk about adding external access points to your PepWave mobile router. All right, thanks for joining us. Sorry if it's a little bit noisy in here. We're in the middle of a big heat wave and I have to keep the air conditioners going so that I don't die. <laughs> So there's going to be three videos in this series uh, and we'll link below to the various videos depending on the setup that you have. Uh, the first video that we're going to cover, which is today's video, is going to be a video that covers adding access points to PepWave Max Transit series devices or other PepWave devices that have the built-in wireless access point controller software built into the firmware. For the most part, for our mobile customers, that would be the Transit series that includes um, our Ultimate Road Warrior, Road Warrior, and Speed Demon bundles. If you have a full timer or essentials bundle, your modem does not have a built-in access point controller for external uh, access point management. However, you can still plug these in. They just have to be configured manually. We are doing a separate video on that which we'll link to in the description below. The third video in this series is going to be covering something that Peplink calls wireless mesh. Um, I'm not 100% sure the term mesh is the right term. Uh, what I like to call it is wireless uplink. And what it essentially means is that you can add one of these access points without the ethernet cable uplinked from this device. We're going to start with this video showing you how to configure and set up these devices using the Ethernet cable, which is the required step anyway if you're setting up mesh. And if you want to do wire, wireless uplink, meaning you don't need this Ethernet cable for this act, uh, secondary access point to function, uh, go to the video in the description below that talks about wireless uplink or wireless mesh. All right, so let's get started with the setup. We've got a Max Transit Category 18 here. If you have a Duo or a Cat 6 or 12 Duo, all exactly the same setup, so don't worry about that. Now, for the example purposes here, we're using the small paddle antennas for Wi-Fi back here and cellular on this device. If you have a roof antenna where you've replaced these with a roof antenna from our bundle kit, that's perfectly fine as well. Nothing really changes with how you're going to set this up. Now, most of our customers, to be perfectly honest, don't necessarily need to add secondary access points. The power that's coming from the transit to transmit off the roof antenna or from the local paddle antennas is typically more than enough to cover um, the length of the RV. But if you're in a situation where you've got a lot of Wi-Fi interference or your coach is made of materials that are causing some challenges for you, adding secondary access points can give you additional coverage in spots where your Wi-Fi signal might not be as strong as you'd like it to be. Before we start with configuring your external access point, we recommend that you check out our Wi-Fi best practices video where we set up the Wi-Fi on your core router your mobile router here first before we worry about secondary access points. That'll probably save you a lot of time and energy, uh, so make sure you check out that video. We go through baseline settings and how to configure it for optimal performance and optimal compatibility with all of your devices in your RV. That is linked below. So looking on the table here, we've got a couple parts. We've got our modem. As you can see here, we have our power to that modem. You may power the modem via the 12 volt or with the included AC adapter. It doesn't matter, but the modem will have to be obviously powered. We recommend getting your modem set up and functionally working with your SIM cards and everything else before you move on to adding access points. You wanna have as few variables as possible when you're setting something up. So get this up and running and working and then move on to this. So we'll assume you've got your modem online and working and you're just looking to add an access point. In addition to that power, we've got an Ethernet cable here. Obviously, this one's a very short cable. Uh, in your installation environment, if you're looking to use a wired uplink, let's not have the wireless from this and the wireless from this this close together. Um, these would create a lot of interference with each other, but just for demonstration purposes, we want to show you kind of how the connectors connect. If you're running up to a roof antenna, you may be able to use a smaller um, cable since that antenna will be up higher, but we do typically 
recommend that you try to get these access points 15 to 20 feet apart if you can so that they don't interfere with each other and you can take advantage of your roof antenna as well as the um, access point uh, inside the RV. In order for your access point to function, it's going to need a couple things. One, it's going to need to be able to receive the internet or data connection, and in this case that's via this ethernet cable. And it's also going to need power. Now the device itself does support something called power over ethernet, which means you can supply power via this ethernet cable. However, the transits do not supply power over ethernet. It's not a feature in those devices. If you're looking to run one single wire and you want to add access points via power over ethernet, you can add our eight port PoE switch that is on our store. We'll also link that down below and that will give you power over ethernet. That switch is very unique in that you can uh, connect 12 volt power from your house batteries and it will up convert that to 48 volts which is what is needed for power over ethernet. Really cool and unique feature but not necessarily needed since this does come with the ability to just plug it into AC power if you have an inverter and you want to run that on your inverter or on our store you can also pick up these DC barrel connectors and what that will do We'll just unplug this, plug that in, and that will give you two screw down terminals where you can connect directly in 12 volt power from your house batteries to power this device. Um, you can pair this with our DC fused 3 amp um, DC power wire that we sell in the store as well. And between the barrel connector and the DC power wire, you can power up these access points and put them anywhere in the coach. Typically people can grab power from a variety of sources in your RV, including your lights and uh, other power sources that are located just about everywhere. Just make sure that if you do grab it from a light or something else, you're grabbing it from the powered side, not the switch side. You don't want your access point to turn off when you turn off your light switch. So as mentioned before, you can technically remove this ethernet cable once everything is configured, not before. And this device will wirelessly transmit to this device and then this will rebroadcast your Wi-Fi. They have to be within range of each other um, and this device has to have that 12 volt power. It's not magical. It can't power itself with, over the internet with, or over the air without any power. But if you do give it power and you set up wireless uplink, which is our next video, you do not need this ethernet cable. But we do recommend that if your installation allows the ethernet cable, if you can get this wire to a location inside the RV to leave this uplink wired, it will mean that the uh, speeds on this wireless access point will be faster because the wired cable is a gigabit cable. And if you're doing wireless uplink, that's gonna be significantly slower. It's still gonna work fine with wireless uplink mode. You'll still be able to watch Netflix and do normal internet browsing. But if you can get that ethernet cable in, it will be more reliable. So if you can run the wire, go for it. Otherwise, move on to the mesh. But either way, as I said before, you've got to set this all up using an ethernet cable. So we're going to get started with that now. Now, if you stumbled across this video after trying to set up your access point yourself, that's okay. But we do want you to follow one step before you get started with our instructions, which are going to save you a lot of time later. Now what you're going to want to do is reset this device to factory defaults so that it can be adopted by the access point controller. It's, it's just for good measure. Even if you haven't opened this and tried it, we do recommend that you reset the device just to ensure it's 100% factory reset so that it will be adopted by the controller. Now in order to do that, all you need to do is unplug the ethernet, just have the device like this, go ahead and power the device up. You'll see a red light there. That light will turn green. Once the device, that, that light turns green, the device has booted up. Take a paper clip, just like this, you'll see a small reset button there that is indicated by an arrow in the shape of a circle uh, with a point on it. And you're gonna want to hold down the reset button there, nice and firm, for about 15 to 20 seconds until this red light turns off. And I'll show you that in just a second once this completely boots up. All right, we've got our green light. We're ready to go. We're going to factory reset this unit. So we're going to hold down that button. We've got a red light there. We're just going to keep holding that. Keep going. Boom. You see how that light started to blink? We're just going to wait a little bit longer. And now the red light is off. Perfect. We're going to let go of that reset button. 
leave that device alone for about one to two minutes. Let it reset fully until that light again is solid green for status. While we wait for this to boot back up, your light configuration may be slightly different if it's a different model than the AP Mini, but that's okay. The reset procedure is the same. Make sure you have a solid green light, hold down that reset button, count up to 20 seconds just to be safe, uh, nice and slow, and then you can release that and let the device reboot back to green and you will be at factory defaults. All right, our access point is booted back up. We've got a solid green light. Now we're gonna take our ethernet cable and we're gonna plug this device in to our ethernet port on the access point and to our LAN with an L, not WAN with a W. We want LAN with an L, that's our local network and that's where access points live. If you put them in that wrong port into the WAN port, um, it's not gonna work. That's, the, that's on the outside of the firewall, so nothing's gonna happen. So you wanna be on LAN. Um, your transit should be powered on and ready to go. You're gonna plug that ethernet cable in and also, of course, make sure you've got power to the access point. That's the end of the initial physical setup. Now we're gonna hop into a screen share and show you how to enable the wireless controller. All right, welcome to uh, my Peplink management console. So typically you'd go to 192.168.50.1, which is the default IP of your PepWave. In order to get to the admin console, you're gonna to need to be connected to your PepWave Wi-Fi. And again, we recommend you follow our Wi-Fi setup best practices before you move on to adding access points. My PepWave is at a slightly different address because I do a lot of technical support and I have to connect to routers, so I need to not use the default address. But for you, it will be 50.1 unless you've changed it. So let's go ahead and log in. Uh, the password uh, default will be admin, but that was likely changed if you've ever been into the admin console before. If you're not sure how to get into this admin console, check out our get started guide, which we've got uh, to give you the basics. I've just moved over to the access point tab and this modem has already been set up. So I just unchecked that. But what you're gonna see is gonna look very much like this if you've not set up access points for external APs. Um, we're gonna take this access point controller and we're gonna enable, enable external AP. We're gonna leave the sync method to as soon as possible. And we're gonna say any permitted AP is allowed because if it's plugged into your pep wave via an ethernet cable, we're gonna assume it's probably allowed. And then we're gonna go ahead and hit click save. And then you're gonna to wanna to click apply changes and confirm up in this corner to enable the access point controller. All right, you've enabled the wireless controller. Congratulations. Now you've got a tough job ahead of you. No, I'm just kidding. All you need to do is wait. And the number one thing people don't do is wait long enough and they think something's not working. It, it, it will come online and it will work, but this will look for access points uh, every so often. Typically I tell customers, wait 10 to 15 minutes for the access point to be recognized by the transit and for the transit to do something called adopt the access point. When it adopts the access point, the access point has to reboot a, a few times. It resets the password and adds some security functionality so that it can control this access point and protect your network. It also takes all the wireless configuration from the transit, like the name of your network and whatnot, and moves it and copies it to the secondary access point. So that can take a little bit of time. The worst thing you wanna do is get impatient and unplug stuff thinking it's not working while it's in the middle of updating, because then you're gonna to have to start completely over from scratch using that paper clip to kind of go back to the beginning of this video. So just take your time, go for a walk, do whatever you gotta do. 10 to 15 minutes is usually all the time you need. Once you've waited 10 or 15 minutes, let's hop back in to our screen share and I'll show you that your access point is now online. All right, we're back inside of the management console. So let's go ahead on the AP tab here, go over to access point. Hey, look at that. We've got some managed access points that are showing up. And in the case of what we've just configured, this is the access point. If you're not sure, you can actually check the serial number on the bottom of the device and it will match this default name. Um, I've actually got two access points in this particular setup. So you see this one that says mini basement. 
if you go ahead and click this edit button here, it will bring up the AP details tab. I'm going to actually give this a friendly name, call it AP rear, leave that as bedroom for the location. And we're going to leave all the other settings default and hit save here on the name and then close. And that has now updated the name here to AP rear. Now down at the very bottom here, you see the name of my transit, which is also an access point because it is transmitting as well. So at this point, you are configured and good to go. To check the status of who is connected to which access point, you can. there's quite a bit of information that you can find here. Uh, if we click on the Info tab here, you'll see your three access points. They're all showing data. And you can actually, un, if you check any of these, it will gray out and it'll show you the remaining information. So if I, for instance, uncheck them all, and I just want to see the AP rear, it'll say, OK, there's no, well, we, there's no clients connected to it because we just booted it up. Uh, and if I can check this access point, okay, I've got three clients on that, and I've got three clients on that. So that'll give you an idea of who's connected, and you can also search by frequency here. Uh, you can also check out this wireless SSID tab here, which will give you uh, each of your networks, and you can expand these out and see total received and send data across each frequency, number of access points, and clients that are transmitting on each of these frequencies. Uh, if you move down, you can. this is a nice feature, be able to see the wireless clients by SSID and um, by the access point they're connected to. Now, I wouldn't be too concerned if you do find that a device is connected to an access point potentially that is further away than another one. If you do find that happens, um, usually if you just reset or reboot that device, it will connect to the closest one. But oftentimes it may connect to a further one if it's on a channel that it uh, feels it's getting a better signal from. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. These devices tend to do a pretty decent job of load balancing across all the access points to maximize how everything works. Congratulations, your access point's now online. It's working, perfect. Now. As we said before, if you're interested in setting up the wireless uplink so that you can get rid of this Ethernet cable, again, you're still going to need the power, you've got to power it somehow, then go on to our wireless uplink mesh video, which is linked below. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you on the road.